So uh, I've been investing in real estate since 2004. Our first property um, was a home that we bought. We fixed it up to live in. And after about four years of living there, we turned it into a rental property while we barnstormed um, Ogden trying to get, uh, get a lay of the land. And uh, the rest is history. We've been in the city since 2000 and, well, since 2004, basically. And uh, it's treated us well. We love the city and we, we like to make the city a lot better. So that's what we've been working on. I've been a broker since 2014. My office uh, is just a block away as well. I bought a, an old house and made it my office. And uh, so I walk to work every morning and uh, life is good. Oh, oh, I should say my bona fides. We do manage right now 110 rental units. Most of those are in downtown Ogden, but we do have some commercial um, and industrial space out in the uh, uh, nether regions of the county that we're managing too. So uh, keeps keeps things interesting. So let's go to the next uh, let's go to the next slide, and uh, we'll talk about this. So all a lot of the charts I'm going to share with you are data that I've distilled out of the MLS, and it's all related to Weber County because, um, I mean, we could get more specific in different markets. That just takes up more of my time, and this gives us a general feel for what's happening, and this is my, uh, my niche in Weber County. So we'll talk about that. Uh, what you see here is days on market, which is how many days it takes to get a house under contract. And this goes back to 1996. And so you can see... Um, you know, back in 97, it was like a 60 day time frame. And then we hit the recession in 2000 and it took a little over 90 days to sell a house. And then we had the bubble, which brought it down to, to 40, you know, 40 days on average. Then we had the great recession, which kicked it up to hundred days. And now um, we have this long slope downward where, you know, on average, uh, right now, you know, the average is less than 20 days to, uh, to sell a home. That's the big picture. Um, if you look at these little blue, uh, the blue line, you know, it bobs up and down. The spikes represent January. And that is because there's snow on the ground and nobody wants to move when there's snow on the ground. So it takes longer to sell a home. Uh, traditionally, maybe not right now, but historically speaking, there is usually a 10% swing in price between January and June. So if you're going to pick a time of the year that is the best time to buy, you should be submitting your offer the first week in January because whoever has their house for sale right after Christmas is hating life and has to move for some reason. You're not going to have the, the pick of the litter because most houses come off the market in January, but if you have to buy, January is the best time of year to do it, so just uh, just FYI. Now let's we're gonna go to the next slide here, and uh, it says, "Oops, the market broke." Let's go to the next slide again. This represents the last four years of days on market, and so you can see these spikes. There's a very clear pattern, right? January it's in February it's high, depending on how much snow is on the ground, and June July is low except for this year, which I don't know what's going on this year. Like there's right now, as of, uh, as of October's figures, days on market was six days, which is hotter than white hot. That's like blue white, you know, vaporize your face hot, you know? Um, so you've got this strange thing going on where we're heading into winter and the days on market is brutally low. Um, so, we're going to find out in the next two months what this uh, seasonal cycle looks like and how that's going to, um, uh, yeah, how that's going to be. Obviously, it's been an unusual year, right? So uh, we'll see how next year pans out. Hopefully, it's more normal. I doubt it. Okay, next, uh, next screen, we're going to talk about house prices. And by, by the way, before we proceed, any questions about uh, what I just presented at all? I see the head shaking. All right. Um, okay. I have one. Okay. Uh, this is Brad, if you guys can't see. Uh, <laughs> Question over here. Yeah. Um, compared to the nation, how is Weber County? Is, is the rest of the nation white, 
burning your face hot, or is this so, kind of exceptional in Utah? So your, uh, your suburban communities, um, places outside of big cities are seeing, uh, seeing similar, similar things. Your big cities like San Francisco, New York, big metro areas, maybe metro areas that have uh, had some uh, uh, social problems recently, uh, they're, uh, you're seeing people you know, leave those cities and move into the suburbs. So prices and rents are collapsing in those areas while they're being boosted by, uh, in the suburbs by people moving into those areas. So um, I know back east, that there's a lot of uh, small towns, you know, small communities that are just, the markets have never been better uh, sales-wise because people are just fleeing the big cities. So that could always reverse, you know, that could switch, that could, that could change pace in a matter of months, uh, depending on events and how things go. So that's just, you know, it, it's interesting. And actually, I think that is part of what's driving Weber County's uh, hot market and I mean, this is Utah wide, not just Weber County. Um, but Utah is a sanctuary state for uh, economic immigrants from other states. Like I, I, I've got a lot of clients from Oregon and California and other, city, other states that have just arrived in the last six to eight months because they like it here and they don't like it there. Um, so as long as that continues, um, and Utah makes sense economically for them to move here, that, that trend will continue. So uh, well, let's pull up house prices and let's talk about um, what house prices look like. So it pains me to actually share this chart because it's so ridiculous. It looks like uh, it's like a caricature of a market, but it, this, these are the real numbers. So this represents um, the way I got this information was I, I took the, the median price per square foot multiplied that by 2,000 square feet starting at the beginning of the MLS data and then just extrapolated that so you had a normalized house price and uh, you know indicates it's a fairly good indicator of market direction and the price of a 2,000 square foot house. <laughs> so um, so anyway yeah this is you've got this weird parabola going on with house prices and uh, we're way way above the 2,000 peak. I mean, if you, bought, if you bought real estate in 2007 at the top, you're doing really, really well right now, um, even though you might have been uh, feeling sorry for yourself uh, for a few years there. Uh, so let's go to the next chart, and we'll look at um, inflation. There we go. This is inflation-adjusted uh, house prices, which even looks more ridiculous. So I took the information you just saw, and then I... Uh, applied inflation numbers to it so that it was equalized and inflation was counted in, you know, this accounted for inflation um, in the mix. And so the numbers are even uh, slightly more exaggerated when you apply inflation. But this is the real representation of value. Um, you know, numbers are always going to go up because of inflation. Like, you know, you could... Your, 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 your wages and house prices track each other, generally speaking. But in this case, we've got a, a, a distortion going on. You can obviously see the bubble from 2007 and then the collapse after that. And then we've just had this tear ever since 2012. Uh, any questions about this at all? All right, everybody's happy. Let's move on to the next, uh, next slide. Okay, so uh, going back to the causes of this uh, going back to the causes of this problem, uh, if you want to call it a problem, depending on which side of the equation. You guys that are new, you're hating this really bad right now, right? Yeah. <laughs> Those of us that own stuff, we're just like, sweet. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's too bad I, yeah, too bad I can't go out to eat, right? Uh, yeah, so, uh, uh, so here we, we talk about immigration from other states. Um, another thing, too, is that trying to build stuff, trying to build supply is a problem because we don't have enough labor. Everybody's too busy coding and uh, building apps to swing a hammer or hang sheetrock. And so it takes forever to build a house. Um, I just completed a renovation project thinking it was going to take us eight weeks. It just took us six months to complete. So um, it's super long and uh, skill, labor is, is scarce. 
You've also got supply chain disruptions. Um, COVID has hit the lumber mills. So getting lumber from uh, you know, the forest to you know, down the supply chain and to the, the hardware stores and the lumber yards has been difficult because the factories where they treat the lumber, people have been sick. And so that's just bottlenecked um, some of the supply. Uh, you also have a, um, a shortage of buildable land because we're here in Weber, Weber County where you've got the mountains and then you got the swamp land out west where the mosquitoes are. And I mean, the lake's low now, but it's not gonna be that way forever. And eventually uh, a lot of people in West Haven and uh, Warren are gonna have flooded basements. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but uh, anyway, there's not enough land to build stuff on. So the only direction to go is up and the resistance we have with that is that the local municipalities hate density. So Weber County is really, um, it sees itself as kind of a bedroom community, or at least it sees itself as a bedroom community, except for Ogden. Ogden is where you put all the density in the mind of, of our suburban friends. And so um, that's a major constriction because there's no more buildable land in Ogden City you have to start tearing stuff down and, and doing that. And uh, given the historic nature of the city, that's a very sensitive topic. Nobody wants their landmarks to disappear for apartments. So what do you mean by bedroom? Oh, so a, be or or a community. community. So a bedroom community, you know, that's parlance for a place where people go to sleep when they travel somewhere else to go to their job. So like, oh. like Ogden has IRS and a lot of, um, you know, we've got Fresenius, we've got all the BDO right here in Ogden City. Most of the people that work there don't live in Ogden City. They live in North Ogden or Pleasant View or Roy or some, somewhere else. Um, just like uh, Layton and Kaysville would be a bedroom community to Salt Lake. Okay. Okay. That kind of thing. So the perception of the mayors in Weber County outside of Ogden is that, um, you know, their bedroom communities, they want enough commercial just to pay the bills and feed their, you know, feed have the grocery stores and stuff, but not, uh, not do too much with uh, apartments or other high density things. Um, and then also like number six there, uh, Ogden is just, or, or Utah is just a cool place to live. It's quiet. We're pretty mellow, uh, pretty nice people here in general. And uh, it's not as, uh, as crazy as some other places in the country. So, so next, uh, next slide here. Um, all right, not all houses are created equal. So now we're gonna go into the house price uh, matrix and we're gonna start pulling it apart and taking a look at it. So let's take a look at our next, next chart here. So, um, so this chart shows you the price per square foot based on size of the house. So I just went into the MLS and I said, okay, show me the growth of price per square foot over time on houses that are under a hundred, under a thousand square feet. These are our tiny houses, right? So if you look at that, you've got this outrageous surge, you know, look back here in, uh, in 2016 and everything was nice and tight together. And then all of a sudden in, in 17, they started fanning out. And uh, so your, your tiny houses have appreciated the most in this last four years, like by an outrageous amount. We went from 90 bucks a square foot to 230 at our last peak, right? Now it's a little choppy because there's not a lot of data points for sub 1000 square foot homes. They're around, they're worth a lot more, but there's not as many of them as there are other houses. But still they're, they're highly valued because just for somebody to get a standalone house on a piece of land that's their own, they pay a premium for that, just to get the four walls and a roof. Yeah, is it patio homes, I think, that are the highest price? Yeah, yeah, patio homes are the most expensive. New, new patio homes, yeah. You know, they actually, um, you can sell them for more if they don't have a basement. <laughs> yeah, which is you know, really? Yeah, ironically. That's weird. Yeah. That's so, uh, so our next little, uh, this line here is the uh, houses between 1,000 and uh, a thousand and two thousand square feet. Um, and then the two other lines that are colored below that are your bigger homes. Those are your three and four thousand square foot homes. And they and and uh, they kind of track together. You know, they're sort of larger and you're going to be in a higher socioeconomic demographic with those homes. So 
guys who bought a bunch of rental properties, a bunch of dinky small rental properties and sat on those um, are doing really well right now. You know, you have, you, you, you have five of them. Actually, you, if you owned four of them, you, you've got a million dollars of real estate right there, right now. So it's, uh, it, it's kind of crazy. I sold a, a thousand square foot home on Oak Street back in July. So three beds, one bath, is on a quarter acre lot built in the mid 60s. So kind of, kind of a Ron Claire neighborhood type of house, but here in downtown. Um, we put it up at 215, had four offers in 24 hours and sold it at 230, clean offer. And uh, I'm like, wow. So that same client, we went to Brigham City and they found a house that was twice as large up on the bench next to the mountain. Uh, same era of homes built in the 60s. They paid two ninety five for it, and you know doubled their their standard of living basically housing wise doing that so uh, so time space, your proximity to the city uh, yeah, interesting things happening uh, right now so let's let's switch to the next uh, slide here okay affordability so what I'm going to show you here is to me it's the holy grail of my charts because it shows you. Um, it, well, it shows you opportunity and it also shows you the pain that's in the market. And uh, what I'm going to show you here represents um, mortgage payments. So we calculated mortgage payments based on, um, based on an average house. So let's go ahead and show you this. This is uh, starting in January 2012, which was the bottom of the real estate bear market. Oh, there we go. Thanks. <laughs> so, um, so you'll see here that that the average mortgage payment or the afford, and this is really kind of an index. It's not an actual, not an actual uh, representation of what mortgage payments are, but it shows you direction. Uh, but basically, the payments have doubled since the bottom. So people are paying twice as much for a house. Now, what's interesting to me. In, in 2014, well, 2013, we had a spike. And in 2013, we had an increase in interest rates. And that actually kind of slowed down house sales at the same time that we were coming out of the government shutdown that occurred. And uh, sales were slow that time of year. And, and 2013 was a weird year because of that. But interest rates increased, which, which made things less affordable. We had that spike. And then in 2014, things mellowed out. You actually started out the year more afford. You started started out the year more uh, expensive than you ended the year. It was more affordable at the end of the year, which was uh, I thought we were going to have a recession at that time because house prices actually started to pull back a little bit, and um, you know, and it was taking longer to sell homes. And you can go back on the prior chart and uh, take a look at the days on market, and you'll see that 2014 things started to increase. Well, we got through that year, and then since then it's just been a tear. In 2018, we had some significant increases in interest rates, which pushed, uh, pushed payments up, and house prices continued to increase even during that, uh, that period of, of increased interest rates until November of 2018, and that's when interest rates started to drop again significantly. Well, house prices were not keeping up with they were not increasing faster than interest rates were dropping, which is why I thought that, as you see here, that I thought that that was going to be a, uh, the beginning of a new cycle downward where housing was going to become more affordable and we're going to have uh, more of a buyer's market. Uh, well, that didn't happen. And so we have what happened this year where the huge influx of people has just pushed the, uh, the uh, price of housing up uh, despite it, the house, house prices are increasing faster than interest rates are dropping now. And so we have this interesting, uh, we're, we're back to where we were in November 2018 as far as housing being expensive. To, if you don't mind me asking, when you said in the end of 2014. If you can just, oh, just yell. Yeah, loud, area. yeah. We got a question over here. <laughs> so in the end of 2014, 
where it went down, was that just because of the interest rates going up? Um, not necessarily. We'll, we'll show the interest rate chart here. Okay. Um, at the same time that that was happening, part of what has driven this whole cycle has been um, central bank credit creation. So you've got central banks around the world that push money and credit into the markets. In 2014, uh, one of the major um, contributors to world credit, which was China, had a big drawdown on credit. And so it was like sucking credit out of the market. And so that was, um, it, it, we felt it in our house prices here, which is kind of weird to think, but, but that reduced the total aggregate amount of credit available in the world finance market, which, uh, which showed up in, in housing prices and, uh, and movement. So shortly thereafter, they started pumping credit again and, and figured out that you know, if they pull back, then that's what, that's what happens to the market. So, okay, let's go to the big, uh, broad picture here. I'm going to go. I, can I ask one quick question? Oh, yes, yes. Um, so, based on this graph, um, even though home prices here have continued to skyrocket in the past two years, when it comes to affordability because of interest rates, um, it doesn't cost me any more to live right now than it did two years ago, even though, say, my house is worth another 30000 that's offset because of the interest rate that, that, that the graph is showing. Yeah, we're, and we're going to sh- I'm gonna, I've got another chart that's going to show you relative values based on interest rates. Okay, so we got you minimized there. Um, so what you're looking at here is the whole series going back to 96, which that's as far back as the data that I have for Weber County. And this is again, this is inflation adjusted, right? So you take inflation out of the mix and you can see that you know house prices may be going up, but inflation adjusted, they stay the same. And here is the classic buyer-seller market cycle. Back at the end of 99, 2000, um, that was the end of a big run in home price appreciation and market values. And then we had a recession. And you can see that drop into 2002, 2003. Then we had the bubble. And you can see the little uh, head and shoulders top there. Uh, in 2008, interest rates spiked and pushed pushed that uh, peak above the dotted line. Everything okay over there? Dave, will you mute um, the other screens? Four three five five three five six thousand. Four thousand. Sweet. Thank you. All right. So oh, you're good. You're good. Um, interestingly, we had uh, um, we uh, we broadcast our church service on Sunday via Zoom and we used uh, a phone up on the pulpit. And uh, one of the speakers was speaking and presenting their message to the congregation and their mother, who's not a member of our congregation, was watching from some other part of the state and started talking to her daughter through the phone um, during her talk. And uh, anyway, so uh, this can be an awkward technology. So, uh, so anyway, you see the bubble in 2008, and then we have a big drawdown that takes us all the way down to 2012. And you can see how extreme that drop was in real terms because we went, um, you know, we went another uh, 30% below the drop in, in, uh, 2002. And so now we've had this run up and we're right back to where we were at, at peaks in the cycle. And the question I have is where do we go from here? How long does, how long does this market stay, uh, where it's at? Um, do we break through that and hit a new plateau at a higher level because Utah values are increasing in real terms because we've got all this in migration um, where we, you might call it the Californiaization of the market, uh, sadly, or uh, do we follow a traditional cycle and go back, um, go back down with uh, maybe uh, lower house prices uh, or something? You know, I don't know. I don't know how that looks. So let's move on to the next uh, next slide here. Okay, so interest rates have driven this. Let's go to the the next slide here. 
Okay, so this is interest rates over the last 30 years. And you can see back in 99, 2000, they're high. And then we had our little uh, you know, three-headed monster here during the bubble. And rates have dropped. And here's our little spike in 2018, right here. Um, and then since that time, rates have dropped. And now we're as low as they've been pretty much ever. You might think of interest rates kind of like a thermometer. Um, if you're too high, you got a fever. If you're too low, you're dead, you know, if, you're, if your temperature's too low. So you want to have some kind of a temperature. Uh, I always worry when rates are, are, are too low. Part of this uh, low interest rate environment thing has to do with demographics. We have a baby boomer generation that, you know, the, a big bulge of the population that's retiring. We have a younger population that um, isn't as numerous uh, coming up to replace that group. And so uh, we've got a little bit of a kind of a, not quite an upside down pyramid in our demographics, but it's not looking great for uh, population growth um, moving forward. So low rates are kind of help, helping levitate activity. And if you want a, an example of where we're headed demographically right now, maybe not as quickly or as extreme, but look at Japan and you'll see kind of what's happening there. Um, and uh, some of that is, uh, it's interesting to see what's happened with their real estate over the last 20 years um, because they're experiencing an interesting, an interesting demographic shift as well. They have like so, a negative interest rate so, so they have had negative interest rates in the past and um, real estate values just don't appreciate much in that environment because there's no one coming in to live there, you know, like they're, they're, they're passing away. And so, you know, who's going to occupy the space? So the only money that I've, I was doing some research on Japanese real estate and the only money you can make in the market if you're ambitious is to go into Tokyo and take like a house and subdivide it into little flats or something and make them luxury flats. And, uh, and that's how people are, are doing it there. But, um, okay, let's check out our next uh, slide. Okay, this is our relative rates chart. And the, the point of this chart is to show you what house prices would be based on mortgage payments if the interest rate was fixed, right? So you, the blue line is just whatever the rates are today or were in the past. And the red line is pretending if interest rates at any given time were 6 and 1.15% because that's when my chart begins there. And you can see there's a significant difference between house prices because when people buy a home, they don't buy, they don't buy a house price, they buy a monthly payment. That's how they gauge whether or not they can afford a house or not is what is the monthly payment based on my income? So interest rates are a component of that. And if interest rates were higher, our house prices would be lower. And uh, what's interesting is the red line looks a lot like our uh, affordability, um, our affordability chart quite a bit. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and move on to the next, uh, frame here. So if, if interest rates increased 3% from where they are now, you'd see a 30% reduction in purchase power, which is why, um, we're in a, uh, what I would consider a low interest rate trap. So policymakers, everybody who's got their fingers and, and on the buttons of the economy, they do not want interest rates to increase for this very reason, right? If your purchase capacity is, is wiped out, um, what that means, like let's say if interest rates jumped 3% tomorrow, uh, home sales would basically stop <laughs> for a little while until the market adjusted to things. And then it would, it would, it would slowly come back over time as, um, as things equalized. And so an increase in interest rates puts pressure on the market and it takes time to heal that, that, uh, that change. So nobody likes that. That's uncomfortable. If you are in office, elected office, at the time that that happens, you are relieved of your duty at the next election cycle. So policymakers have a very strong incentive to keep this low interest rate environment going. Okay, so what kind of deals are being done out there today? Um, we'll move on to the next, uh, next slide. The one that I'm seeing right now is buy high, sell higher. 
um, what other choice have you got? Right? I mean, uh, if you're a value buyer like me, you're scratching your head wondering, okay, where, where are all the really good deals? And uh, it's like dropping a, a little drop of water on a hot frying pan. It's just, if it's there, it's gone instantaneously. Um, so, okay, so sell hot, buy high, sell higher. Uh, you've got buy, hold, break even now, cash flow later. That's popular. Um, I'm seeing a lot of investors get into uh, multi-unit properties where, you know, they get their mortgage and they might make 50 bucks a month on a fourplex, knowing that next year they're going to raise rents a little bit and the year after they're going to raise rents a little bit and they can get moving forward that way. So that's a legitimate strategy. It's popular because, um, well, what else are you going to do? All right. So next, uh, next slide here. Okay, lose less now. This is, uh, this is worse than the prior slide. This is just, hey, I got money. I got to get rid of it. You might find this with 1031 exchanges or someone who's taking capital and moving it around. Uh, you know, it's like, I just got to find a place. I had some clients like this two years ago where they're, get me into a place now, I'm going to lose this money. So we bought a place where they lost like 50, 60 bucks a month. And they were really happy. <laughs> they're like, thank you for finding me this property. Seriously, you know, because because they were going to lose, you know, tens of thousands of dollars in uh, in capital gains if they didn't do that deal. So it's like, OK, well, I'd rather keep the capital and just lose a little bit. And now, since that was a couple years ago, we're now positive on their on their cash flow a little bit. So, OK, let's go to the next slide. And they probably gained five figures or more in appreciation, too. Yeah, they've gained a lot of equity. Yeah, yeah they've gained a lot of equity. Um, so the stat that I, that I put up on Facebook um, yesterday was that from October last month to October two th or 2019, Weber County house prices appreciated 20.7% in one, one year, which is just, it's outrageous, frankly. But uh, uh, yeah, so that's, it is what it is. Okay, so some interesting trends. Uh, I showed this uh, clip. I've actually had this uh, slide in my presentation since 2014, so lucky you. Um, just updated it uh, last night. Um, so gross rent multiplier, this is a yardstick that we use to measure our deals. Like, is this a good deal? Is it a bad deal? How does this deal, um, you know, rate compared to other things? And uh, so what, what, what this how this yardstick works is it answers the question of how many dollars am I willing to pay today for one month of rent moving forward in time, assuming you're not going to increase the rents later, right? This is just, this is just a yardstick for right now today. It doesn't consider, it's not a dynamic uh, measuring stick. So in 2014, some most investors were willing to pay $94 to get $1 of rent per month. When you hear the um, the one percent rule, that would be a gross rent multiplier of one hundred. So, uh, two thousand seventeen, we jumped to one thirty nine. Two years ago, we were at one fifty two, and uh, as of the last six months, I, I went and pulled all the sales for multi units that had rental information um, from yesterday for the last six months, and our gross rent multiplier is averaging. 158. So it appears to be mellowing out a little bit. The acceleration is not as much uh, over that time. So, uh, but it's still a 68% increase in a short period of time, right? So, uh, any questions about this particular topic from our group? Uh, yeah, uh, Jeffrey here. Hey, Jeff. Can you uh, just explain it? Um, one more time. Okay, so um, so gross rent multiplier is designed to, it, it's another measure of value, right? Like how do you, how do you measure the value of a multi-unit property? This is really for rental properties or income properties. So, you know, and, and you could use it for single family residences, um, but most of the time it's with multi-units because 
they come in so many different shapes and sizes and layouts and ages and locations that, you know, trying to get a, a handle on, on, on comparing apples to apples is kind of, it's, it's difficult sometimes. And so this gives us, if you know the average in your market, which is why I'm sharing this information with you, if you know the average, if you look at a deal or, or an opportunity, I should say, and you start calculating what is the gross rent multiplier for that property, you can gauge it against the average and say, well, this is higher than average. And then is that justified? Uh, in fact, let's show you the next, I'm gonna show you the next slide because I actually show you the data set that I used here. So 158, this red column in the, in the middle, that's the average for the last six months. Properties that sold at a higher uh, gross rent multiplier, you'll see those in the very far right where they're up to around 200, which is kind of outrageous. Um, those were probably either very nice new properties in a good location, or they were purchased by an owner occupant who didn't care because they needed a place to live. And at the opposite end on the left hand side here, you'll see these guys. These are, these are in Slumville here. These are like your dumpy properties. I, I saw them in my, anal in my data set when I was working on it that, you know, these are, these are your ugly properties that need a lot of work. And that's why they're below the average gross rent multiplier. So you'll find pristinely done properties, usually up in this category, and then your dogs down here. And your average, that's where you're trying to pick through and say, okay, is this, you know, is the property functional? Does it have a lot of deferred maintenance? If it has a ton of deferred maintenance, the gross rent multiplier should be lower. If it's in great shape and ready to go and you're at the average gross rent multiplier, hey, you're getting a pretty good value, you know? So it's, it's just there to help you measure that. And I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. That, that last slide, was the last slide based on multi-units as well? Uh, so, well, so the last, the prior slide was all multi-units. Yep. Thank you. Yep. That was, yeah. So they, these figures all represent multi-unit properties in Weber County. What are you saying? I'm sorry. What are you saying with regards to single family homes? Are you seeing the same type of trend? Well, it's actually higher in single family homes. Um, yeah, it's, it's probably more towards the 200 range um, because single family homes are being, if you put up an investment property, owner occupants are going to show up to bid it and they're emotionally invested in that property as opposed to an investor who's like, well, I'm here to make money. And the owner occupants like, well, get out of the way. I'm not, <laughs> you know, I'm here to like put a roof over my family's head. So the owner occupants will always beat out the investors unless the house is totally trashed. Um, in that case, the, the, usually they're not interested because they don't have the time or energy to fix it. But if it's marginally occupiable, expect to be outbid by an owner occupant. Can I do a follow-on question to that? Sure. What are, what are you seeing with regards to people who are coming into the area? Because it would seem to me, just from an objective point of view, to be a rather lousy idea to, to own a home at this point. Uh, if you can rent it for what would be looking to be somewhere around half to two-thirds of a percent uh, per month of the value. Mm-hmm. So um, that's, actually a, that's actually a legitimate point. You Right now, with interest rates being so low, because now keep in mind that the lower interest rates have distorted, distorted that gross rent multiplier a little bit, right? Because it's made, your price can go up, but your, your break-even point is still lower because of the lower interest rates. So that's pushed everything up. Those lower interest rates have pushed that gross rent multiplier up. But... Um, it's about what I'm seeing right now is that in order to buy an income property, it's going to be a break even proposition. So you owning it, you're going to be able to charge rent that's going to basically just pay for the mortgage and the expenses. And you're going to have to hope for, for rental increases over time. Uh, historically, the last five, six years, rents have increased about 5% per year. And as we've seen here with, you know, recent, these recent numbers, 20% per year in a house price increase, uh, that's pretty dramatic. But I'm seeing right now, I'm actually seeing some of those rental increases showing up in the marketplace. 
because the, the out-of-state buyers are crushing the local buyers. Folks that have been here for generations and are working local jobs um, are being killed by the engineers that are being hired at Hill Air Force Base. I think they're hiring three engineers a day at Hill Air Force Base. Those guys are all coming into the market and just, you know, with six figures outbidding everybody. So, I, Isaiah, do you want to raise your hand? <laughs> Isaiah is one of those coming from out of state. Who's that? Who's an engineer? Not at, not at Hill. Not at Hill. Not at Hill. Northrop. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah, making rockets. So, um, yeah, so, so what I'm saying is probably resonating with some of you. Some of you are getting ulcers based on what I'm saying. So, uh, but it, it, I guess the, the silver lining here is that you can make money in any market. It just requires a little bit of risk tolerance, a plan, and you need to be in the right place at the right time. And if you're not trying to be in the right place at the right time, you will never be in the right place at the right time. Um, I bought, so I bought a bunch of real estate in 2006 and 2007. I bought a fourplex uh, and, and I bought it in March of 2007. And then I did a $45,000 renovation of this 5,000 square foot fourplex. Um, a lot of fun war stories, had to kick some pimps and hookers out of the building and had my life threatened and all, it was, it was fun. Um, but at the time, I thought, okay, well, I paid two fifteen for this fourplex, and the market said that it was worth two eighty, fixed up. So I put the money into it. I was going to have twenty thousand dollars equity in the building. I was going to refinance because they were doing, you know, no, uh, you know, stated income loans at the time, and I was self-employed. So I thought, oh yeah, no big deal. Well, in the middle of my refinance in July. The lender went out of business, and um, I quickly jumped over to another company where we refinanced and closed, and then three days later, that company went out of business, and by the skin of my teeth, I was able to get that building refinanced because uh, I had a terrible loan on it getting into it. Um, and so I licked my wounds with that property because rents were low. Uh, like I was, There were three bedroom units, and I was renting them for like $595 and $600 a month. And so I was making the payments. I was doing an interest only loan. So I was just making the payments and eking it out. Um, grateful that I hadn't uh, lost the building and then lost all my money that I put into it that I'd borrowed. And um, was just waiting for that day of redemption when, hey, this investment will pay off. Well, around 2014, that started to happen because prices started to increase. Rents were increasing this whole period of time. And, um, Today, that fourplex is worth a little over 400,000, and my rent rolls are around 3,000 bucks, and you know we're doing, we're doing pretty good. So, um, so anyway, you, you can, you know, I bought right, even though like I paid below market for that building at the peak of the prior market, and I survived, right? If you pay full price at the peak of the market, you're going to have to wait longer for your redemption. And uh, there's that saying that all that, that time heals all wounds in real estate, and um, you get rich in real estate in ten years. You just don't know if it's the first ten, the middle ten, or the last ten uh, that you get rich. But you will get rich eventually. So if you have a long view, you'll be fine. Um, okay, next uh, next slide. Okay, so this is an out of the box thinking experiment here. Um, I, you know, I was look. I, was, I wanted to compare asset classes, and I said, okay, what happens if we look at gold? And because a lot of, I remember back in the back during the, the last market bust, at another, uh, real estate seminar, that we gathered at ten years ago, whose organizer shall remain nameless. Um, Dave, that's a joke for you. Uh, Somebody in the room was always talking about investing in gold because they thought that'd be a better investment than real estate. Well, if you invest in gold and you invest in enough of it, uh, you can, you can uh, uh, arbitrage that to get back into real estate. So if you had 500 ounces of gold back in 2000, 
you could have bought five houses in 2012 in Weber County. So um, food for thought, you know, if you're looking to, to diversify or, or whatnot. Um, if you want to buy gold in mass, if you have cap the capability to do that, uh, you might be able to arbitrage the market and, you know, use that to get in and out of real estate. So food for thought. I thought that was kind of a fun, fun mental experiment there. Uh, somebody also made a request online when I told them I was doing this seminar. They're like, do it with oil. And so here's an oil chart. So if you purchased 8,500 barrels of oil and kept it for 12 years, <laughs> you could have bought uh, four houses with your oil. Um, I have no idea how the oil market works. I don't think you would have a place to store 8,000 barrels. It probably cost you more than, you know, <laughs> than the oil's worth. And uh, um, yeah, and I don't even know who, how you'd sell it. But anyway, uh, fun, uh, fun thought experiment. So now appears to be a good time to buy oil in preparation for the next, uh, next market drop in about 12 years. <laughs> And storage units. So, yeah, if somebody's doing storage units, yeah, right? I mean, Austin's doing storage units. There you go. Put oil in it. Okay, so let's talk investment strategies. Where to from here? Um, so, for the guys, for you guys that already own uh, uh, property and you're like a little squeamish about the market, something you might contemplate doing is improving your current portfolio and raising rents. If you've got, um, let's say you got 10 units and you go and you, you know, you raise rents 50 bucks a piece with a little bit of capital improvement. Let's say you spend two or $3,000 making things nicer. Um, you could raise rents 500 bucks and that's like having a whole new unit, right? So you can maximize your ROI and, uh, and do that. And that also prepares your, your uh, property for any downturn in the market because it keeps your property um, top of market as far as condition and, and desirable. So you don't have any vacancy problems in that kind of a situation. Okay, so um, you could also speculate, which this is a, a legitimate um, real estate investment uh, uh, practice. So right now, if you are to come into the market, if you can't find a distressed property or something below market, and you just buy something that's average on the market, you're going to be speculating that the market's going to go up over time. So your horizon of how, how far out in the future you're looking is going to be uh, the, the, the determining factor on your success or failure in that investment. If you've got a two to three year window, that might be too short, right? Because there might be some, uh, some volatility in the real estate market in that time frame. If your horizon is seven to 10 years, you're probably going to be okay. Um, you know, ideally you want to find that value property that's below market, pick it up and, and do something with it. Um, now there are some things going on in the market right now in, in, in the banking sector that, that have caused me to believe that this actually may be a, a, a workable investment strategy because this year, our federal budget deficit, our deficit, not the budget, but the deficit itself was $4 trillion, right? That's like as big as our entire budget. It, it, so for every dollar our government collected in taxes, it spent two this year so far. That's unsustainable um, the, and it has to be paid for. And the only way to pay for it is to um, inflate, right? So right now you've got the, the treasury, which is issuing treasury bonds, it's loaning money, or I should say it's borrowing money from people. They issue the bond and say, hey, we'll pay you later. Give me your money. Well, the banks that are buying those treasury bonds are selling them to the Federal Reserve. So the Federal Reserve creates the credit. It's basically like a printing press, with, but on a credit basis. And so, um, so the Federal Reserve is effectively financing the spending of our federal government. Um, and that can only go on for so long without consequences. And so um, it's highly likely that this credit creation and the stimulus, like you see the government sending checks to everybody, like I got a $4,000 check in the mail from Uncle Sam, uh, uh, you know, on this, 
COVID relief. You know, after I got done puking in the toilet, I went to the bank and deposited the money. But, um, you know, it, anyway, don't get me started on that. But it's, uh, but that we will probably see more of that, um, which puts money into the marketplace. So that creates inflation, that lifts rents, that lifts the price of milk. Um, what I found in uh, the downtown low income areas was that most of, uh, most of the people who received their stimulus check bought stimulants with their check, which all created a very lively scene in our neighborhood for about six weeks. Um, and I can tell you more stories about that later. So, uh, okay, let's go on. Oh, any questions about that before I move on? No, they're in stunned silence. Okay, we'll move on to the next. Uh, um, next. I, I oh. do have one okay. question. This is Brad again. Um, you said that it's um, unsustainable to continue to inflate the currency. Yeah. Well, what, what are the so, repercussions of just inflating ourselves out of debt? Well, so, so what happens is, it's kind of a complicated answer, but Right now, because we, well, because we won World War II, right, this goes back to World War II. Because we won World War II, we were the last man standing. Everyone else's factories and cities were bombed to oblivion. We were the, the, the last man standing on the hill, and our currency, the American dollar, became the reserve currency or the stable currency that other banks used in reserves to balance their books. And they used ours because we were stable and because we won. Like they didn't use, um, like they didn't use Czechoslovakia's currency, right? There wasn't enough of it. It was a small country and it was unstable, you know, but, um, but America was big, it was prosperous and we were, we were predictable. So what happens when you have a reserve currency, when you have the privilege of having a reserve currency, you get to print your own money and not have it hurt you. Um, you basically export your inflation to other places. So rather than the cost of milk going up here, it goes up in other places. And, uh, and it's because the, the money just spills out of your market and your country into other countries that use your currency as a reserve. And so they start getting too much of it and then it starts messing with their exchange rates and, and all that. So an example of how that affects countries would be the Arab Spring of 2011. We um, were printing a lot of stimulus here because of the recession and putting money into the mar world markets. And Arab countries at this point were, that were eking by um, saw the price of food go up which pr produced social, um, uh, social distress and therefore political distress. And then that's, what, that's really what provoked that situation over there was uh, food shortage. Inflation. In, food shortage induced by inflation. Is that what's happened in like the Venezuela and Bolivia more recently? Uh, well, yeah, they're, they're, their currencies have devalued to zero. Yeah. And so, yeah. And so then- Is that Venezuela and Bolivia's status right now? Yeah, so their currencies are worthless, you know, and, and that's, and you can see what happens if your currency gets too devalued. Now, because we're the reserve currency of the world, we don't have to worry about that right now. But there are um, movements in the world to remove that reserve currency status that we enjoy. And other countries are triangulating, particularly our geopolitical adversaries are triangulating to work around the dollar and create a separate uh, currency that uh, other countries can use as reserve and to transact. And so um, if that were to happen and we lose our reserve currency status, which when we spend $4 trillion and export that inflation to the rest of the world, it doesn't make them happy, <laughs> right? Um, it provokes them to wanna to make those changes. Then uh, it means that our interest rates must go up to pay for the money that we just printed because people will not buy our, our treasury bonds unless there's an interest rate stuck on that that is sufficiently high to compensate for the risk. And if we don't have reserve currency status, it's more risk. So at the moment that we switch to where we, we're not the reserve currency of the world anymore or that's severely attacked, 
um, then you might see interest rates increase, which takes us back to our relative value chart with interest rates and saying, okay, how high do rates go and, how, and what does that do to real estate values um, in the near term and long term? And, uh, you know, to me, like a natural interest rate is around 6 to 8%. That's like natural over time. With, with uh, depopulation and everything else we see happening, and that's, a, that's actually a worldwide phenomenon is um, our lack of reproduction. We just have forgotten to reproduce ourselves. Um, uh, too busy watching YouTube, I guess. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so with that, you'll see low, in, you'll see low interest rates. But at some point, you know, these forces start to, start to tug at each other and it, you know, what, what wins? And sometimes this can be uh, messy. So I'm not predicting anything big in the near future, but these are like long-term trends that, that could affect uh, real estate values over time and, and your investment. Like you're, if you're looking on the 30-year horizon, it's definitely on the 30-year horizon. Is it on the five-year horizon? Probably not. Maybe 10, 15, something like that. But... Uh, but in any case, if you've got a mortgage now and you've paid, down, paid it down by half when that time arrives, uh, you're doing all right still. And you have your asset, you're not upside down, you got equity and, you know, and uh, you're in good shape. So, all right, <laughs> long, long answer. So That's a lot to digest. Everybody's mind just melted. So, okay, so your third strategy, buy a fixer upper, add value through improvements, and rent or resell, right? This is your value, this is your value buy. Tried and true, it works every time. You can do it in any market. Um, you just have to find the right deal. Okay, so here's, I'm gonna give you an example. Okay, this is my project house. Uh, we purchased this a year ago. It is, I'll give you the stats. I want to ask you how much you would pay for this property. And Dave, you know too much about this property, so don't answer. Um, so it's 1,650 square feet. No, 1,635. So you got 835 on the main level, 835 in the basement. Uh, it, its configuration when we bought it was four bedrooms, one bath. Um, so I'm 0.17 acres, and it's choking with methamphetamine. How much would you pay for this property? Where is it? It's at 599 8th Street. Uh, Anybody? How much are you going to pay me for it? Uh, that, okay, that's a legitimate answer. Okay. How much are you going to pay me for it? Okay, anyone else? Okay, let's move. Any, anyone else? Anyone else want to wager? How much? How much? Any, anyone interested in this property? Uh, maybe at like one twenty-five. Well, how much worse is it? It's choking. It, it, it's choking in meth. Um, well, look at it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, look at right. it. All of those things that you've uh, mentioned are like dollar signs. Yeah, to me. Yeah. To me. Okay. Well, I can I can throw out my guess okay. number. Okay, how, how much would you pay for it? I, I would guess the ARV is probably two two fifteen. Okay. All repaired. Okay. So, being a meth house with a lot of work, fifty plus on the renovation. So I'd need to pay one about what Devin said, probably between one twenty and one forty. Okay, one twenty to one forty. I got one twenty. 140, and how much are you going to pay me to buy it? Anyone else? <laughs> yeah, my, my numbers would be, you know, 125 is probably the most I'd pay, and I'd say ARV is probably in that 220-ish. Okay, 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 next slide. Okay, next slide. Okay, how about now? <laughs> how about now? Less. Let, let's go to the next slide. <laughs> next slide. That's how valuable stuff. You could resell that. <laughs> got one like this in Salt Lake for 90,000. Okay. 90, so what I, what I want you to notice here in this next slide is the uh, tent up on the somebody the ladder and the tent. Somebody was oh living up there. So underneath this is a hut and somebody was living in that too. So 
Um, this whole place was electrified with extension cords. He had floodlights. This is actually a big floodlight right here. Um, and then there was like a, there was people sleeping underneath the trampoline that I'm standing on when I took this picture. Um, oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it, it was actually one of your motels, Dave. Hey, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was like that. So here I am in the attic. We removed 15 yards of trash from the attic, and it went, all went through an 18-inch by 20-inch hole in the floor. He had dis, that bookshelf you see there, he had disassembled and reassembled oh in the attic. And the front gable, he had tie, you can see the Tyvek there behind, my, behind me on the wall. Um, so yeah, that tie back here. So, so he had behind this was a room that he had made out of Tyvek and there's a sleeping bag and somebody's pillow and they're like little suitcase sort of thing. So it's a five and, flex now. So it was a, it, six. six, we're up to six. So, <laughs> and then the other gable was also Tyvek off. And so people would go up in the attic. It was fully like had Christmas lights and electrified and, and crazy, crazy. So, um, yeah, so, so, so how, much, how much are you willing to pay now? It's over my head. It's yeah. over your head. Uh, like 70, 100 to 110. 100 to 110. Okay. Um, Someone else said 70. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. So this is a, this is a screenshot from the video. So, so we put an 18 series or 18 episode video series together on this project. So you can actually see us purge this place. Um, this is the meth hut where the tent was on top of um, after we cleared it out. And there is me running away because I just pushed it over and I want to get out of the way before it uh, hurts me. Um, okay, so next slide. Here's the house today. Wow, wow. awesome. And uh, so that, uh, um, yeah, total, total transformation. I, I, should, I should have put some more photos of the inside. I just took some today. I didn't have time to put them in the slideshow. But we basically refinished the hardwood floors. Um, so this particular project, we, the, uh, well, does anyone want to guess how many yards of trash we removed from the house and the yard? So how big was one dumpster? Like 30 yards, 30 yards of dumpsters, yeah. So probably 15, 30 yards? 17. 500 yards of trash purged from wait one of those huge yeah huge dumpsters 13, 17 of those yeah so we we moved 10 tons of metal to the recycling center were you on we got, the show yeah so we ended up we earned about $900 in recycling fees from from that yeah which really didn't i mean i i really got more out of the muscle building but i was going to say that covers like a couple of those dumpsters yeah so, so let me give you the numbers on this one. We paid 60000 for the house. So 70 was close. Yeah. 70 was close. I, w I wanted to go 50 and the seller was like, you know. So we did 60. It was seller financed, 10% down. Actually, $5,000 down is what we did. And we got a 4% note on a 10-year amortization. On 10 years? 10 years. So our payment on the house was 550 bucks. Mm -hmm. rental? Yeah, well, it was, uh, it, it was owned by somebody else, and the person that lived there just lived there rent-free for 20 years oh, gotcha. and decided to make money turning it into a landfill. <laughs> um, so the budget on the house was 85000 mm -hmm. to get it to a very superior level. And um, I talked to our loan officer today. Our mortgage payment is going to be about $850 when we're done, because we're going to have 140. We, we, I borrowed private money from two different individuals to pay for the rehab. So I got a $50,000 loan and a $35,000 loan from people I know. And so we put a lien on the house for those second and third mortgages. Um, plenty of headroom, because the, the market value is 220. That's sweet. Yeah. Yep, 220 post fix up. Good work. So um, our mortgage payment is going to be about 830. Rent on this is going to be about thirteen fifty. That's where we're going to shoot for, and we reconfigured it so that it's a three bed, three bath house. We we turned the. It basically has a big bedroom upstairs, 
and um, it had a bedroom and a bathroom. And then a wonky second bedroom that they'd made into, they walled off an opening with MDF and then like punched a hole in the wall to get into that room. Uh, so it was really lame. So we turned that front bedroom into a, a living space. And then we turned that uh, bathroom, we blew a door out or blew an opening out in the wall and made it a master suite and then added a powder room for guests. So you got separate toilets there. You're not doing a Jack and Jill deal. And then we put a bathroom in the basement uh, where the two bedrooms were. And uh, yeah, so it's, uh, it's a cute little cottage now. It's meth free. We did get, um, while, while we were renovating the property, the methamphetamine cleaners were there doing their work uh, to, before we could get started actually. And they were doing the testing and the, and the methamphetamine numbers were actually going up while they were cleaning the property. They're like, wait a minute, our readings are higher than what they were when we started cleaning this place. Like, what the heck? And we found a window that had been kicked open on the back side of the house where people were sneaking in at night smoking meth. <laughs> and so we had to chase them out. And uh, this property was a notorious, notorious house for 20 years in the community. And uh, we don't have an ant trail there anymore. So I'm actually surprised. I bet if you were, I guess, knowing that you're refinancing it as a rental, 220 is probably what you'd get. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so if so you were to sell it, I wouldn't be surprised if you could get even more. Yeah. So 30, 240 maybe. So yeah. So the so the comment is, if we refinanced it, 220 is would be where it's at, and we could probably sell it for more. Um, that's probably correct because when you're looking back on comparables, that's backwards in time. Mm -hmm. And if you're on an upward trajectory, then you're looking down the hill rather than up. So time, you know, I mean, we, I actually showed this to some prospective clients who I thought might need a place to rent. And I told them what, it, you know, its value was They're like, oh, we'd pay more than that for this. Mm. And I'm like, okay, well, if an appraiser could justify it, then, yeah, yeah. you know, we could, we could do that. But, sure. um, but this is part of our real estate empire, right? So it's just going to be put in our portfolio and we're going to rent it out for the next 20, 30 years. And then, um, once it's paid off, maybe we'll just sell it and trade it up for a commercial property or something else bigger. You know, use by by you know if we use 220, let's assume that house prices don't increase at all over the next 15, 20 years, because um, my house payment's going to be a 20-year mortgage. Um, then in 20 years, I could just use that all that equity as a down payment on the next property, and that would get you into a million-dollar property with 20% down, right? And then just let those tenants pay down your million-dollar mortgage. Yeah. And uh, or eight hundred thousand dollar mortgage. So, um, okay, yeah. If you want to see videos, I get. If you want to text me your uh, email address, I will send you a link to the YouTube videos. I get, I promise you they're very entertaining. There's mummies. There's um, more dead things. There's uh, mummies. Yeah, there, there's uh, like mummified things. Oh. Like actually dead. Not, de not de actual like. Well, not hu mummies. not human mummies. <laughs> we found dead. We found animal mummies. Yeah. Yeah, in the place. Uh, there's uh, more car parts than you can shake a stick at. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. Questions, comments, concerns, queries, or worries? So yeah, I guess going back to que your, question over here. the property that you just showed, I always like the creative way of doing deals and with little to no money out of, out of your own pocket because you leveraged other people's funds, mm -hmm. at least for the, the rehab. When you, when you do the cash out refi, are you basically, you're able to pay them back and will you be any money out of your own pocket when you do that? Just out of so, curiosity. Yeah. So did you guys hear that question? Okay. Okay. Yeah. So the question about money out of pocket. pretty quiet. Yeah. You probably should repeat it. Okay. So the question is, um, when I refinance this example property we have, which has three mortgages on it, um, Am I, is there going to be any money out of my own pocket in this, in this process? And so the short answer is, um, at the very end, yes, uh, because I've been, so first off, I had to pay for the meth cleaners up front before I borrowed the money. You had to fix it. So that was out of pocket. That was about $4,000. And then um, I've been carrying the mortgages for the past year. So I've had that carrying cost. It's been about a, a little over $1,000 a month of, of, of dead weight that we've been 
carrying to get this project done. But in the end, um, well, and in, but I justified that because the bulk of my payment is principal because of the aggressive amortization. I'm like, my net, my net worth improves $500 every month. So I'm like, eh, it's okay, we can carry this because most of it's principal. But if it was all interest, I'd be like, let's get this out of here, you know, let's, let's but we knew that this was going to be a long project. It took us to get all the trash out. I mean, we would go by every couple of weeks and spend a day and, and fill a couple dumpsters. It was probably accumulatively two or 14 full working days because we had to carry everything out by hand. Um, but, uh, and it made a great video series that everybody will enjoy. <laughs> Gather the family around and watch. Um, but, uh, but the backside is, is that we got paid $80,000 in equity to do that, right? So how much will you pay me to buy this house? Well, the house paid me, you know, $80,000 on paper. And uh, so that's, that's the upside, right? And you just have to say, okay, is, what's the risk? I mean, I guess the place could still be a, you know, an EPA super fun cleanup site. <laughs> you know, we're not sure. We'll see what grass grows and what doesn't. Um, because we still have to put a yard in the back. Um, the, that, that entire backyard, by the way, was almost completely covered in rubber mats. Like, so just nothing would grow back there. Uh, it was crazy. So, uh, okay, that answers, that answers your question. Does it glow? It does, it does not glow. It does not glow. Yeah. So no Christmas lights. But, it, but I can huff the fumes from the dirt. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, more general question there. Um, with the white hot real estate market that you're seeing in, in Ogden, are you starting to see people trying creative solutions to housing, such as renting out rooms or uh, other alternatives? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because there's a there is a shortage. And so um, if you want to call it hacking your house, you know, and turning it into a, a, a room rental situation, that will work if you're owner occupied. I would totally avoid it completely from an investor standpoint if you're going to be absentee or not on site it's a it's a can of worms to manage and um you have a uh, diffusion of responsibility because you're leasing out a bedroom instead of the whole house and so if you've got three or four dudes in or, or girls even in your in your building who's going to clean the toilets who's going to clean up the kitchen who's responsible for that you know, and, uh, you know, if, so, if one person damages the kitchen, how do, who, whose deposit do you take it out of? You know, where's the accountability? So there's a diffusion of responsibility that occurs in those situations. But I actually have current tenants that we work with um, where we actually manage, we manage that for them and they're living on site. So we do all the screening. We, you know, we, we make sure that they're a good risk and they're going to be compatible with the other roommates and, um, you know, and they'll, they'll pay us the rent and the owner doesn't have to worry about it. But, um, but we definitely want the owner there because if he's not, then it could turn into a can of worms. You going to do a follow on question to that if you don't mind? Sure. Um, one of the things you talked about earlier was some of the surrounding communities out there. Uh, to me, it just, it, it's, to use a term we use on the East Coast is NIMBY, um, yeah. where they don't want the density. Um, is that something that you see changing in the future or are, are, are the local politics of such that, you know, we're going to draw the line at our, our city line and we're just not going to have an infill? It's a, it's probably a 20 year process. Um, it, and it's a generational thing because the history of Weber County is that the people that live in the suburbs right now, and I should say those that are over the age of 50, they purposefully move to the suburbs to get away from Ogden's density. Like they, they, they were, they're there for that reason and that reason only is to have a nice big lot, quiet neighborhood where they don't have to worry about rentals and whatnot. That's Ogden's problem. You know, that's, that's for Ogden. That's not for Roy or for North Ogden or these other communities. And so it's going to take a generational shift, a paradigm shift that will happen. I mean, those in my, de in my you know, I'm, I'm early 40s. And I can see the merits of this and that it's got a place in our communities. 
So um, basically you just need enough people moving along the, uh, uh, the timeline of life for that paradigm to shift. Say that again. Oh, so it must have been an errant remark there. So hopefully that answers your question. Chip, you still with us? Yes, I still am. Sorry about oh. that. My, my mute button's not working for a while. <laughs> okay, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah. No, no problem. Any other questions? Uh, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to just stay on that track just a little bit more. Uh, and kind of ask a follow-up question that's similar to what Chip was asking. Um, and uh, talking about zoning and ordinance, I think you, you mentioned there's a distinction between Ogden and outlying places. I'm most interested in South Ogden, but as far as renting out a room or renting out your basement, um, from what I understand where I live, I can't do that. That's illegal according to you know zoning and ordinances based mm -hmm. on you know our dash one dash eight means right you know you, you can't rent out your basement legally um is that different in south ogden and, and outlying places as opposed to ogden because you're, you're mentioning that it's okay it kind of sounds like you're saying it's okay to do that in ogden so ogden has um uh certain zones where mother-in-law apartments they call them accessory dwelling units are are possible they're kind of in the center of town and uh, the high in the sort of the historic core and also kind of up by Weber state. And so, so that is, it is, you have to be an owner occupant to do it, but you can do it. Um, if you do it outside of that zone, you might be able to get away with it, but if you get caught, you're going to get, you know, you're going to get cut. So, uh, Got you don't, it. you don't want that to bite you. Cause if you sign a year lease agreement with a tenant and suddenly their lease is cut short by seven months because of your, um, skirting the rule, so to speak, that it's kind of bad form. So, um, so yeah, so the, the cities recognize the need for density. They're struggling with how to do it right. And, uh, they're kind of nibbling it at the edges on a lot of this. Okay. Very good. And along that same, uh, along that same vein, uh, Airbnb, do you know, do you have any, do you have your, your thumb on the pulse of Airbnb and, and <sighs> how that's, uh, how that's working yeah uh, if that's a problem in, in any area that so can... so ogden city's ordinance is you can have one air one vacation rental per block face so let's say you got the 22nd block of jefferson the east side could have a rental and the west side could have a rental a, a, a vacation rental they have to be licensed with the city and you got to pay a 10 percent hotel tax for your revenues most people forget most people for and, and that that 10 percent hotel tax is a state tax. It's not um, a city, not Ogden specific. So if you do it anywhere, you're supposed to pay your hotel tax. If you don't, the state will find you. <laughs> and they did this back about three years ago where a bunch of uh, Airbnbs in the historic district were just raking in the money. And then suddenly the state comes in with this big bill like, hey, you owe three or four years of taxes on this. And at 10%, that's pretty expensive. So wow. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that may affect the, uh, you know, the decision matrix on cost benefit for doing right. that. And I noticed that wasn't one of your strategies that you mentioned earlier. When no. You were, when you were mentioning strategies, <laughs> you know, we have trouble getting cleaning ladies to show up once, you know, once a month to clean up a, an empty rental property, let alone showing up every three days to clean a rental property. Like, I mean, just these cleaning ladies are crazy trying to get them get them to show up regularly. And that's, and, and if you don't have a clean Airbnb, then you're toast, right? Cause yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. Um, I've been, so it sounds like I've been skirting the rules for about two years now. Um, and this, and me, I, this meeting is not being recorded or, uh, you okay, know, good, good. Yeah, well, <laughs> they'll bleep that part to, out. Try to track me down. I, <laughs> I had my, I had my uh, living room on the video earlier, but anyway, um, yeah, that's uh, that's great information. Sounds like I could end up paying ten percent for the last couple of years of yeah. my quote house hacking uh, adventures. So that's yeah, I would uh, I would encourage you to get square with the state. I'm sure they'd be happy to hear from you. Interesting. <laughs> okay, very good. I really appreciate your time. Yeah, um, thank you. All right, any other questions? Hi there, it's William Hawksbedler. Haven't haven't seen you in a while, Jeremy. Hey. Um, 
I, I apologize. I, I showed up late to the meeting, but I'm super curious to hear if you hadn't addressed it already what your uh, ideas are of what's going to happen starting January 1st when the moratorium's on eviction, oh. fire, and the forbearances, and all of that. Oh. Yeah. So that is actually an, uh, that is a topic near and dear to my heart. Um, so we, uh, uh, so I had my first experience with a moratorium back in June, um, with the governor's moratorium. Can, can you define that for us? So, so the governor in May basically said, you can't evict anybody during the month of May for non-payment of rent, That's a, moratorium. a moratorium, an eviction moratorium. Okay. And, uh, so he said, okay, you can't do that. Well, of course, during that period of time, I had tenants stop paying rent and they just went incommunicado, right? They didn't talk to us at all. They didn't work with us. Um, so, so uh, and I guess, actually, I think the moratorium was in April, if I'm not mistaken. So it was an April moratorium and then in May it expired. So May 1st came around and we uh, went and posted the notice on the tenant's door hadn't received two months of rent at that point, and they were already behind about four or five months on utilities prior to the moratorium. So, um, you know, we were getting concerned with the utilities, but then the rent really just, you know, threw a wrench in things. So May 1st, we post the three-day notice. The guy's a disabled veteran. He's in his mid-30s. He was a big Prop 2 supporter, liked to smoke a lot of weed, and he also had a lot of guns. And so... So I, uh, I, I post the notice. Now, keeping in mind, we didn't place this tenant in the property. This is one we inherited from the prior property manager, a property management company that will rename Nameless in this meeting. Um, so uh, anyway, I post the notice. Suddenly, I get this like manifesto from the guy basically saying, hey, we're dirtbags, and uh, you guys are jerks, and you're going to kill me because COVID is out there. And if I have to move, I'll be homeless, and I'll die of COVID and uh, you know, you're, you're gonna kill me. So uh, we just didn't respond to that, and then he got the summons from the court, and then he's basically saying, hey, look, I'm gonna kill you and myself on my way out, uh, so you're messing with the wrong dude, and uh, escalated the situation where we got law enforcement involved uh, at that point to do a welfare check. And then when we did the lockout, in the mid of, middle of June, because it took six weeks to get through the court, um, we had three officers with bulletproof vests show up and clear the unit, right? Um, fortunately for us, he had left about an hour and a half or two hours earlier. But he did leave all of his furniture, but he did take the grow farm in the basement, which was most important. So he did have his priorities correct. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, on January 1st, right now, we about so we manage about 110 units, and about three, a little over 3% of our portfolio is having COVID problems with rent payment. Three. 3%. So I think we have about, we have about five, a little over, yeah, so we have about five tenants that are just saying, hell yeah, hey, you know, I can't pay rent, I'm, I'm all COVID-y or whatever. <laughs> and... Uh, you know, and we've, we were struggling with them before. And now it's just like this thing where they know that we know we can't do anything. And so we're just sitting there staring at each other, smiling. And so on the 1st of January, we're basically going to be posting these three day notices to pay or quit. Um, I'm actually going to probably terminate their leases, of, go post uh, termination notices on the 1st of December. So they know, Hey, look, you can't live here anymore and you're going to be an unlawful detainer on the 1st of January if you don't move out because at the 1st of January, we can start evictions. And so I might as well get a head start on that and know that they're playing with fire. Um, so who's going to stay and who's going to go at this point? I don't know. Um, most of the tenants that uh, are playing games with us right now are tenants again, that we inherited recently within the last two or three months. And so these were ones that we were going to turn over anyway, and now we just have really got a good reason to do it. Um, but we got to wait till the first. So it should be a very active and exciting first of the year. Do you think it's going to have sort of macro and economic implications? I mean, we're going to, are, are we going to have a wave of 
for closures when in starting in March to ne into next summer because of forbearance issues? Are we going to have homelessness because of ev evictions? I mean, is, what's that going to do to our housing market? Anything? I don't know. Well, so the good news is, is that in the meantime, before that, it's actually a boost to the economy because the tenants are spending all their money on other things. <laughs> so right. local retailers are liking this, right? Because the money's going somewhere, um, you know, and then, um, uh, but yeah, so you are going to have a lot of homelessness at the first of the year, I'm pretty sure, because these people will have completely disqualified themselves from obtaining housing elsewhere. Uh, and then that's going to follow them around for about seven years on their collections record. Um, the owners right now, the banks are actually pretty lenient. Like if you go and contact the bank, they'll give you some forbearance if you want it. Um, like most of them are, are understanding of the situation because it's kind of a political situation. If they don't offer the forbearance, then that puts political pressure on, you know, the politicians who offered the moratorium and they don't want that. So, you know, it's sort of the people that are losing are the people who, own the banks, I guess, you know, they're, they're not getting interest for now. And, uh, Forbearance it, payments going on the, on the tail end of these mortgages? Yeah, they'll just tack them on at the end or, you know, re amortize or whatever. I, I, so I'm hearing mixed stories out in the market of, of how the forbearances are working. And some of them aren't doing loan mods like that as, as often and making them all do and payable all at once when, when the forbearance expires and stuff. Like, yeah. And I, I haven't heard that, but that, you know, that, uh, cause we're all assuming that the tenant will just pay all of their rent that's due on the first. Right. So the mortgage could be paid. Right. <laughs> yeah. Highly unlikely. Um, yeah. So I like back in March, was it March or April? Um, I, I bank with golden West on my income property and my loan officer called me up. He's like, Hey, Jeremy, you need a forbearance. And I'm like, you know, I had words with him. I'm like, dude, don't you ever ask me for that. I will always make my mortgage payment. Like he was daring me not to make my payment. I'm like, no, no, I, you know, anyway, that was fighting words when he called and tried to offer me a forbearance. But, um, but yeah, but the government with this moratorium is, I, I'm in the middle of an eviction in North Ogden right now. Um, we just took over this property a month ago and these folks are two months down on rent. The people, the people that are, that own the property, um, just weren't familiar with proper screening methods and they ended up with a really bad tenant, like a professional tenant. So they didn't pay rent. We're down two months now. Um, they're back on utilities and now we're in the middle of this moratorium. So I'm like, what do we do? So I'm sorry. I'm looking for nuisances. I'm looking for uh, non-compliance. And we had some opportunity um, when the tenant told the owner they couldn't trespass on the property and tried to keep them out of an inspection and the police showed up. And so that gave us a, that gave us a case or gave us a uh, piece of evidence to use to show non-compliance, but it takes more than one data point to do it. So we got to do another inspection on Friday this week, lucky us. And we're going to go in and see if they let us in. If they don't, then that's a continuation of non-compliance and we can move forward with an eviction. But if they let us in, then we go, you know, we're noodling around still trying to find something. If, if maybe they have something that's uh, like if they're using drugs in the house or they've got a, a, a violent offender, you know, with a hatchet close by or something that, you know, something dangerous that um, we could sh say it's, a, it's an imminent safety and health threat, then that's a nuisance and we could evict. But... Um, I'm finding out that in this whole COVID moratorium thing, it's hard. And my clients are extremely upset, understandably, because um, they're watching these people just hold their house hostage. And um, like, what do you do? You know? I, I've got one more if I can, if I can hog the mic in, in, in Jeremy's time. Uh, you, you, I'd love to hear your analysis. Uh, you, get, a, get a piece of your analytical mind on, on a dynamic that I'm seeing here, obviously, we're very familiar with the tight inventory in the market, and I look around in my the various markets that I, I work in, and I'm seeing hundreds and hundreds of rental units going online. And what does what does a thousand multi-unit 
in Ogden and 500 in Logan. Um, I mean, what do, do those huge quantities of brand new rental units and apartments do to my uh, single family owner occupant uh, inventory shortage? And, and, and what does that do to my market? I yeah, it. Well, the market, we call it the market mix, right? So like what, what, what's available in the market? Your new apartments are always, your new apartments are always going to skim your, apart, your apartment dwellers over to them, depending on the location and the quality of the finishes, right? But if it's new and nice, then you're going to get the, the new and nice tenants, right? Your, your grade A tenants will move to that. Now, I'm looking at some of these rental units in Ogden going, what in the world are they doing? They're building... 30 units across the street from the dog food factory. Why are you doing that? You know, that's not a place for an apartment. Well, who's going to go there? Maybe that's rapid rehousing for the homeless shelter, or maybe that's section eight. What's that? They're from Provo. They're from Provo. They don't know, right? Until, (laughs) until they open those doors of the food, of the dog food factory. And then, you know, you get to like, you know, absorb the effervescence of rendered lamb, right? You know, (laughs) oh yeah. So, but, but so, you know, I'm seeing these new these new apartments go up. There's the buildings over on Fifth Street at Five Points. Those are 1,250 bucks a month, and I mean, they're dense. They're packed in right there. I guess it creates sort of a sense of community and city center, right there at that at that intersection. Um, my Eighth Street property is just a block and a half away. You know, so the question is, if it's a question of lifestyle and standard of living. Obviously, living in a nice house is better than living in a nice apartment for the right family, you know, situation. You know, if you if you need the place for the kids to run around, or or you want the space for your dog to run around, a home is going to be better suited than an apartment. Um, but there's going to be that group of folks, maybe like young marrieds or um, just young couples, that will glom onto this, um, you know, these apartments. They might be more affordable than their parents' house where they want to be. Um, and maybe they see it as a springboard cause they're not going to be there that long cause they got college or whatever and they're going to move on. So, uh, you know, so it does, it adds some more inventory to the apartments. It will typically newer construction will, will pull forward the, the best tenants, which leaves your, which actually provides a for, more affordable opportunity for folks at the lower end of the scale. And, my business model is to dodge and avoid being at the bottom end of the scale. Like I don't want to be at that bottom because I don't want to pick up those tenants. I want to keep myself in the A, B category on tenant quality. Does that answer your question? Well, yeah. Do you think, I mean, do you think the bottom tier of buyers will drop out of the market if there's nice, rental housing to live, which might loosen up the tension in. in sure. The- oh yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because a house to live in is a house to live in, you know, whether you're buying or renting, you know, you got to do something. And so if you don't buy you rent, and then that pulls the buyers out and satisfies the housing demand for the time being. And then those apartment dwellers will ultimately become home buyers. Um, If, you know, but if all those home buyers are housed in an apartments, and there's no new houses to be in the inventory. That's just a bunch of people warehoused in an apartment building that want to buy a house. <laughs> and, that, and they're all going to bid for the same house. So that, that, that's just going to continue putting upward pressure until, that, until the inventory for what they, um, you know, what they want is available. And, uh, and so, yeah. So, and, sometimes, and you'll see these movements where suddenly a demographic or a or a group will shift because let's say interest rates change and suddenly a whole flood of people come into the market that weren't there before. Then they disappear when interest rates go up or maybe a new, like, uh, like Northrop Grumman is uh, recruiting and and bringing people into the community. Right. And so you got a wave of people coming in just right now and then they'll disappear in a couple months because they'll all find something and crowd out some other low poor local chap who can't afford the house that he was trying to buy. (laughs) No offense, or actually offense completely intended. (laughs) Yeah. All right. A question over here. This this is Brad. Um, uh, Are we in a bubble? I'm gonna. Everything you know and forecasting the market. 
Are these low interest rates going to keep putting upward pressure on the prices of houses here in, in Weber, Davis, Northern Utah, or are we I, in a bubble? I don't think we're in a bubble in the sense that like the last bubble was created because we had too much housing supply and not enough people to live in that house. We had speculative building. We had, and it was all based on bogus financing. It was a credit bubble. So as long as there was financing for houses, why not buy five houses? Except there's not five people to live in them, right? And so when that, when we hit that critical mass of too much housing and there was, and the realization of rents to, to service the debt that was accumulated during that period, when, that, when we hit that moment, the bubble collapsed and it was devastating. Everything that's been, every gain in house prices that we've had up until this point has been related to low interest rates. If you go back to that relative interest rate chart I showed you, I mean, rel relative to 2012, we're still pretty high. Um, given, yeah, yeah, given, given where we were. Even if interest rates were higher, house prices would still be higher, right? Um, than they were back then, just not as high as they are now. Um, but the... Uh, but, I th but everyone's got a job, everyone's got a down payment. There's no speculation in that, right? Um, so, the so the drivers of the market will be interest rates. We're at a little under 3%. How low can they go? How low can they go? Because if you go too low, no one wants to buy your treasury bonds, right? Or your mortgage bond, or your mortgage stuff. It could be that the Federal Reserve keeps interest rates low, but the mortgage market starts to float up because that's a transactional marketplace, right? Where it's, it's outside of the banking. Anyway, um, so, so if interest rates stop dropping, if interest rates just stay right where they're at, you will see house prices moderate because the, dec the decline in, in interest rates has driven house price increases the last two years. Can I follow on to that question? Yeah. You know, Given some, you know, something you talked about earlier with dem demographic trends, now I, I think this is probably not going to be much of an issue in Utah because you've got such a huge amount of in-migration, but as people age, they pass on, their, their property you know, goes up to sell to the next generation. Um, seems to me like the population is actually, and I think you referred to it as almost an inverse pyramid. Uh, you know, is that trend really going to hold? So, well, um, in-migration distorts that pyramid. So if you, if you had a you know if you had a border fence around each state and just let everybody sink or swim on their own reproduction, um, you know then then you probably see this more dramatically. And unfortunately, Utah also has this uh, um, lack of an urge to merge, if you want to call it that. You know we uh, we just aren't having children at the same rate that we have in the past historically, which is sort of a, it's a secular trend that's global. Um, and Utah follows along with that, where we're right around, right around replacement, maybe even slightly below it, where the rest of the country is well below replacement. Um, so, the but the, but my my crystal ball sees Utah as always being, for in general, a haven state from other places. We are geographically removed from any other major metropolitan areas. Where getting here, in order to get to Utah, you got to want to be here. Your closest metro is Boise and Denver. And, you know, Boise is, is smallish, slightly bigger than Weber County. And um, Denver is huge, but you got a mountain range and Wyoming keeping us apart. Who wants to travel through Wyoming? Um, you know, so if you want, you know, to come to Utah, you got to want to be here. And there's sort of a self-segregating uh, process that occurs when people come to visit. They either like it or they hate it. And those that like it stay and... And, uh, you know, and those that don't stay or, or move somewhere else in the country. So I, I think that there's always going to be this sort of pressure. I think, you know, the interest rates are a dynamic that affect everybody. If the nation goes into a recession, like if the country goes into recession, Utah will be affected, but not nearly as badly as everywhere else. Our, our economy is, is super diverse. Um, like, like we have one of the most diverse economies where we don't have any, we're not lopsided in any one particular type of employment or industry. And so, you know, locally, 
it might affect certain places in a transitional kind of way. But, um, and I guess just to give you a, for, a, an example is that during the bubble collapse and the great financial crisis, Las Vegas lost 70% of its value. Real estate in Vegas lost 70%, like catastrophic end of times devaluation of real estate. Um, Utah in that same period lost 15%. It went down and it went down in a way where like, you know, we could feel it and our stomachs were, were you know, up in our throats and it didn't feel good, but it, it wasn't the end of the world. And, um, and it was actually an opportunity, but it, but if, yeah, we, we'll, we will lag the rest of the country probably by about 18 months if there's a, if there's a slowdown or economic belly flop. And um, if it happens here, it'll probably be muted. I mean, right now we're at below full employment. Unemployment here is, in Utah is 4% or less. So we have a labor shortage already. Where the rest of the country, I had a guy from Oregon I talked to last week tell me, hey, unemployment in Oregon is like 10%. I'm so happy to be here. You know, I got a job, I'm working, and we're like, hey, great, we, got, we, need, we need more bodies. We need more houses too, but we need bodies. And uh, so, you know, that, I think the state's well run, and so you'll probably see that dynamic happening. It's, that's a hard thing to change overnight. I've got another question. Oh, I, can, I can just add an example of the employment shortage. Uh, I work for a large contract manufacturer in the BDO. We sent out 40... Um, I, what do you say, work um, approvals or em, employment offers? We were, yeah, offers. We had 40 offers and we were supposed to have 40 new people start on Monday. We only had 14 show up. Yeah. And that we sent out 40 approvals. We got over 100 job applications the week before. Mm -hmm. And so our, our contract manufacturing business is, is breaking down because we, we literally can't put bodies on the floor. Yeah, and we can't put bodies on the floor because we don't have enough houses to, to house them. And uh, yeah, because otherwise they would move here. Like locally, there's not enough labor. The labor's moving here, but then they got to find a place to live, and that, and they're having they're having trouble. So this, th it's a feedback loop, right? It just keeps going around, and and at some point, it will have to uh, equalize, or there'll be some sort of hiccup. So in fact, about a year ago, somebody said, "Well, what do you think is going to be, like, what will knock this market off?" Because I've been predicting a recession since 2014. Right. So one of these years, I'm going to be right. But <laughs> but they're like, you know, we have 40,000 more buyers than we have houses. You know, 40,000 households looking for a place to stay than we actually have rooftops to put them under. That's throughout the whole state. So that was 2017. Right. And it's probably gotten a little bit worse now. Let's just looking at the numbers and how aggressive these days on market and things are. But but we thought we were actually making inroads on that in 2018 and 19, but we've had a blowout. Um, but uh, yeah, that imbalance, um, it, it's only going to, I predicted that the only way that we would have that change was either we had an asteroid strike or a pandemic, right? <laughs> and thinking like, you know, I mean like a real pandemic, you know, and uh, because you'd have to eliminate that 40,000 buyers. buyers or 40,000 households that are demanding housing. You eliminate the demand and then you go to equilibrium. And that's where your stable house prices are. So as long as we keep adding people to the pot, we're going to have a, a continued uh, dynamic like we are. And it just it comes down to the, you know, all these bidding wars for the houses are at the margins. The person who can pay the most you know, wins. So if you bid 250,000 and someone else bids 255, that 255 is the new level and you're out, right? And, and you're out of the game. And the person, the next person's got to come in at 260 to be competitive. And so it's, it's um, that's, that's why I mentioned the Californiaization of the market because that's where California is now. You go to Anaheim, California, you go you know, acro across the street from Disneyland, are these nice little ranch ramblers, three bed, two bath, 15, 1600 square feet, three quarters of a million dollars. I'm like, who can live here? Like, who, what kind of job would I have to, I'd have to be like a CEO of a company to buy one of those and live in it. You know, like how, how in the world do you make that work? So 
Um, but that's, but what people do in California is they sell in Anaheim and then they move over to Redlands, you know, or they, they just transfer their equity to a different part of the market. Or they make a huge splash in a pond like Utah by moving to Utah with all that equity. And then that just makes the rest of us upset. Unless you, you own go. properties and you just ride the appreciation. Unless you happen to buy a lot of properties a few years ago and you're happy. <laughs> you probably know this firsthand as well. But I've got a friend, I just helped him sell his house, but he was getting into bidding wars just to lease another home. He mm -hmm. offered, yeah, he offered uh, the property management company and the land and the homeowner a full year, the full 12 months Oof. of lease up front, and he still didn't get it. No. Yeah. Yeah, well, I have a place. It's almost bidding wars for rental properties right now, too. Yeah, well, I have a place on 8th Street. We can talk to him about that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I haven't had any bidding wars on rentals yet, uh, but I do get, you know, I do get uh, multiple inquiries a day on, on properties. Yeah, I guess it just probably depends on location. And, yeah, 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 timing. Yeah, okay, anything else? May have exhausted your, uh, what's that? I think, I think you've done it. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, guys. We'll talk it to him. Yeah.